There you go. Okay. Uh, once again, thank you everybody for joining me this morning. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you. We're going to be talking about the assignment tool in Blackboard. Uh, and this is the tool you primarily use to create almost everything the students hand in uh, online. Uh, and I'll talk about setting up an assignment, uh, and then also talk about the student perspective, how, what it looks like for them to hand in the assignments, and then also about grading the assignment. Uh, hopefully we'll have enough time to cover all that. Um, so we'll jump right in. I'm in, uh, I'm sharing my screen right now. Can you all see me? See my screen? I yes, should look with like glasses. My <laughs> uh, let's see, let me, uh, let me uh, make that a little bigger for you. Thank you. Uh, the better. Um, okay, uh, so I'm in my Blackboard course and I'm in my content area. Uh, I've got a couple of assignments already created, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, touch those in a little while uh, when we start talking about grading. Uh, but first, I'm going to jump into creating an assignment. Uh, and to do that, you want to go to the assessments uh, drop down in your, uh, in your toolbar, and then go right to assignment. And then you'll be presented with the create assignment uh, area. Uh, it's broken down to several pieces. Uh, we'll start with the easiest part uh, where you give the assignment a name. And if you're familiar with creating uh, basic items in Blackboard, uh, this is very much the same. You give it a short, brief name, much like you would do with an email. Uh, you can actually select what color you want the name to appear in. I recommend sticking to things like uh, black or other colors that are easier to see. When you get into uh, playing around with lighter colors, it can be difficult for some users to be able to see what they're looking at. Um, once you give it a name, you want to fill in your instruction area. And the instruction area has our standard uh, uh, text editor features where you can do some basic functions just like a word processor. Um, you can put just about anything in here, uh, much like you were creating uh, a content item uh, with, the, uh, with the item tool. Uh, you can insert video, you can put images, uh, you can do basic text editing. This is basically where you want to tell your, your students what they need to do for the assignments and uh, explain due dates and things like that. Um, once, uh, once you finish editing your instructions on your name. You want to come on down and we've got a few different options you can play with here. Um, you can attach files to uh, the assignment. Uh, examples of things you could do, uh, maybe you have a separate instruction sheet uh, written in Word or maybe there's an Excel spreadsheet you need these students to be able to see and access. You can attach that directly to the assignment and they'll be able to download it. Uh, sometimes uh, part of the assignment might even be filling in something that already exists and that's where you can attach it here. Uh, much like uh, creating regular items in, uh, in your content area. You can browse your local computer um, or you can browse your content collection. Again, that is um, something newer to NEC and uh, we'll be doing a deeper dive on content collection in the near future. Uh, but content collections are a great way to manage all your Blackboard resources without having to keep it all local on your computer. Um, you can also browse a cloud storage um, and previous webinars, this has been present, but I haven't really talked about it. Um, and what this allows you to do is 
connect your Blackboard account to a service like Dropbox or Box uh, or Google Drive, uh, places where you store things in the cloud online. Uh, if you use this tool, keep in mind that you're connecting to your personal account uh, uh, and it, the connection will stay open until you tell it to be removed. Um, but for now, you could browse your computer to attach documents. I've attached some instructions that I feel good about and I want the students to use. Uh, your due dates um, are pretty straightforward. You want to, if you leave due date blank, the students will have an open-ended amount of time to submit their assignment. Um, if you check the box and enter a date and time, the students will be able to uh, submit the assignment even after the due date, but if it's a post due date, uh, the assignment will be marked late. It's a, just a way to help you keep track of uh, who's doing their work and keeping up with, with, uh, with the syllabus. You want to enter a points possible uh, and really the points that's up to you and how you're running your course and of course, uh, you know, how, how your department wants to run things. Um, you can also add rubrics. Now, uh, you could create a set of rubrics uh, yourself ahead of time. And then if you have pre-created rubrics, you can select a rubric and go and find it in the pop, select rubrics pop-up uh, and select it and add it to uh, add it to the assignment. Uh, if you don't have any and you still want to add one, you could create one on the spots. Um, sort of sort of sidetrack here. You go into <laughs> the create rubric screen. Uh, you give it a name uh, and a description. And really, the name and description that's all for you. Uh, it's all a reference uh, for you to associate which rubric is which that you create ahead of time. This is my writing rubric. Oh, I am, can I interrupt you for a minute? Absolutely. Um, when you just clicked on the rubric, mm -hmm. I'm seeing absolute bl uh, black screen. Oh, really? Huh. I'm not seeing anything. Should I go to view options? Oh, same here. Did, did it go blank? Oh, let's see. Hmm. Technology. <laughs> I think that's a Zoom thing that yeah. start okay. clicking around. Oh, you know why? Um, let me do. Mm, now it's got the focus now. Um, let me see what happens when I do that. Now uh, we're back to Blackboard. Oh. Okay, uh, so uh, <laughs> what you didn't see was a, uh, was a pop-up screen. Uh, it was a create rubric screen and all it was really asking for was a name for the rubric and uh, had a description box. So I could type in a description for my rubric. And once I submitted that, it, it added it to the area um, uh, that you're looking at right now. Um, I can go back and I can edit that rubric. There are tools inside the pop-up that will allow you to edit the rubric as well. And um, I'll look into uh, why my pop-up was turning black. Let me try it one more time. See if you, do you guys see the new bot window or did no. it go black again? It's black for me. Okay. All right. I'll have to look into uh, that. Um, on the plus side, we will be doing <laughs> a webinar uh, discussing creating rubrics. Uh, so uh, we'll have, uh, we'll be able to go over that even more in depth in the near future as well. Um, uh, suffice to say, you can add a rubric to the, to the uh, assignment if you wish. Uh, it's a good way to help your students know what kind of things they can expect as far as the grading goes. Um, you don't have to add a rubric, it's completely optional. Um, and then you have a series of options and these by default, 
you'll probably not change a lot in these areas, but uh, we're going to do a little deep dive into them uh, because there's a lot of different uh, options you can do to help tailor the assignment to what you want to achieve in your course. Uh, so we'll start with submission details. And these are expanding boxes. Uh, by, by default, they're going to be closed. Um, but when you click on their names, they'll expand out. And under submission details, uh, we're going to start with the assignment type. Uh, and it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, in Blackboard, uh, you can, uh, there's a tool where you could create groups and you can split your, your, your class, uh, your students in your class into separate groups. Uh, and using that tool, you can then create assignments specific to a particular group. Um, uh, and so the assignment type lets you select whether it's going to be an individual submission, which means students submitting work for just for themselves or whether rather they're submitting for a group. Um, there's also a po portfolio submission. I'm not really going to jump into that um, today. Uh, the portfolio uh, is something that Blackboard uh, has. Uh, it's very interesting, very cool to use. And we'll probably do a webinar on it. Um, but uh, some so occasionally in a course, people want to use portfolios, and uh, this is where you would do a portfolio submission as well. <clears throat> so pretty straightforward, individuals or groups. Um, generally, by default, it's set to individual, and generally that's what you're going to be using. Um, number of attempts. Uh, this is a great way to control uh, how often the students submit the assignment. Um, if you're ever worried about whether they can submit it multiple times, this is where you set that. By default, uh, it's set to a single attempt, which means once the student submits an assignment, they cannot submit it again unless you, the instructor, go and, uh, and, and uh, give them the ability to resubmit. Um, now, if you have something that you're going to be, say, working on with them and critiquing and you want them to continually improve it, uh, or, uh, and uh, you can allow them to create multiple attempts. Um, if you, when you select that, you get this maximum attempts field. If you leave it blank, they will have unlimited multiple attempts, or you can create a maximum number of times they can resubmit. Um, you can also just set it to unlimited attempts. Let them go as long as they want uh, resubmitting the assignment. Can I jump in on a funny thing there? Yeah. It's, um, I found myself going back and um, resetting submissions a lot of times because students submitted the wrong paper You're right. <laughs> something like that. And I never said no. So I just routinely hit unlimited because I didn't know how to decide how many, if, if I was going if, to limit them. So I just, okay, there'd be unlimited. <laughs> and I did that routinely. And, um, but I did catch a student view of Blackboard on a student's PC one time. Yep. It's, it's not wrong or a problem or anything, but it's really humorous because at the bottom in very large fonts, it says, you have unlimited. <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> Free ranging. <laughs> they, they're, they're great advertising. Right. <laughs> um, uh, so um, and then uh, after the attempts area uh, comes uh, in, uh, just an amazing feature that Blackboard uses, and that's their plagiarism tools. Uh, they use a tool called SafeAssign. When you check this box, uh, you've, you'll activate the SafeAssign tool for this assignment. And what that does is it takes the submission uh, from the student and runs it against uh, several databases of information. Essentially, it checks it against things that exist out 
out in the world um, for plagiarism. If they're copying, uh, if you're copying dialogue or, or, uh, or, and it matches it up, it gives you a report and it tells you, gives you a percentage on how suspicious the paper might be. Um, is it, Infallible, absolutely not. Um, if uh, you get a report from Safe Assign and it and it looks suspicious, you should definitely follow up and look and check it out. But it's a great heads up tool uh, in case somebody is cheating. Um, uh, when you do activate the Safe Assign tool, uh, you have a couple extra options that go with it. You can allow your students to view the report uh, for their attempt. By default, they cannot. Uh, if you allow them to, they can see where they're, <laughs> uh, they're they might, uh, if they want to, uh, you know, argue that they're not cheating or something like that, you could, you could activate this and let them look at the report themselves. Um, and, you can also check this box that excludes submissions from institutional and global reference databases. If you want to give your students some leeway, if they're going to be quoting a lot of things from local references, this is a way to uh, give them a little bit more leeway with the report. Um, and those are the submission details options. Um, In the grading options, pretty straightforward stuff here. Um, you can enable, so by default, none of these options are selected. Uh, so it'll be straightforward grading uh, if you don't change anything here, but you can enable anonymous grading. Um, which means you'll receive submissions and you can go and grade them, but you will have no idea which student has submitted it um, uh, until the grading has been completed. Um, you can set the, the parameter by, uh, by uh, setting a specific date for uh, for the anonymous grading to end, or you could even just say after all submissions are graded. Um, it's an interesting tool. Um, not being uh, a, uh, a trained faculty member, I'm not really sure when that would be useful, but I'm sure you all would have some great ideas for when, to, when that one might be. Uh, a great tool to use. Um, and then you have this delegated grading, uh, which is very interesting tool. It's a great way to do peer reviews and things like that. Um, it allows you to um, have your students grade each other, or if you have uh, specific, uh, maybe you have um, uh, teaching assistants in the course or people Who's, who are designated specifically to grade uh, assignments. This is how you could do that. Um, um, Can I interrupt? So I, absolutely. I teach Bridges and I have a PL, a, a, a peer leader that co-teaches with me. Yep. I would put that student there. I would allow yeah. that student to have access to the Yes, uh, they probably ha you probably give them a role like a teaching assistant or something, uh, right. or even uh, there is actually a greater role as well uh, in Blackboard, um, and uh, they do they would appear here, and then you can tell you you can check off the box that lets them reconcile grades, okay. um, or specifically which <laughs> which grade which uh, submissions they can grade that kind of thing. Okay, that's um, helpful. Yes. Okay. Um, So grading options, pretty straightforward stuff. Oh, okay, display of grades. Uh, this is mostly just for how you want grades to appear to the students, uh, both in and out of the grade center. Um, 
an interesting thing that they offer is uh, a dual uh, I don't want to, <laughs> a dual way to show the grade um, where it says display grade as you can show it as several options uh, a score uh, percentage letter uh, or complete slash incomplete um, the lettering uh, you have to set up ahead of time um, there's a way for you to create a uh, a schema for <clears throat> what letter assignments go with what percentages. Once that's set up, uh, using this option would uh, would fill it in automatically based on the score you give the, uh, the assignment. Um, but uh, you have a primary dropdown and then you have a secondary dropdown. Uh, the secondary only shows up in the grade center. Uh, the primary will show up both on the assignment itself and in the grade center. So you could have uh, you could have set both options. So on the assignment, they might uh, they'll see a letter grade, and if they're curious about what their actual score is, they could go into the grade center and see a score. Uh, it's just a way for you for you to uh, display things in a way that is useful to your students, um, or uh, or if it's. Uh, you know, they maybe uh, it's just a complete incomplete assignment, but you want them to know how how well or how badly they did on the assignment, and then you could do a uh, a primary of incomplete or complete, but still show them the score at in the grade center. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the next option here include in grade center grading calculations. This is incredibly important to. Uh, a uh, option. It's by default. It's always uh, checked um, when you create an assignment. It automatically gets added to the grade center unless you come in and uncheck this. If you do not have it checked, it will not be part of the weighted uh, grades in your grade center. Uh, it will not be calculated to the student's final grade. <clears throat> um, if you have uh, assignments that are complete or incomplete. You, this might be a tool for that, or if it's an optional assignment uh, that you don't want to be graded, you can uncheck that as well. Um, you can also hide the score uh, from the students in their My Grades tool. Uh, by default, they're going to see their grade, um, but if for some reason you want to hide it, you can uncheck that. And, and then an, a tool that's that a lot of students find uh, useful is the show average statistics for the assignments. Um, and it essentially, when the student goes into their grades area and they look at the, their grade for an assignment, next to the grade, there'll be a median grade for the class. Uh, and then they can compare it to see how well they're doing compared to the rest of the class where they fall inside that that curve. <clears throat> um, by default, this is turned off, but you could turn it on very easily just by checking the box. Um, but by default, the, dis the grade will display as just a score um, in both the assignment and in the grade center itself. Display grades. And then an area that is common to pretty much everything in Blackboard is the availability area. Uh, by default, it's automatically available, but you can uncheck that uh, if you don't want to make it immediately available. Um, also, you have uh, a way to limit your availability. Um, if you want the assignment to appear after a certain date or you want it to uh, be available to the students until a certain date, you can set those options here. Uh, by default, they're turned off, which means the assignment will be available until you make it unavailable manually. Uh, if you set these parameters, then, uh, then they'll, those parameters will take precedence. Uh, and you don't need to set both parameters. You can set just a display until or, or display after. Uh, it's a great way for creating your assignments and content ahead of time and then uh, and knowing that it's just turned off until it 
you until the date arrives and it'll automatically be turned on for the students. Um, <clears throat> and you can also set the option to track how many times uh, the assignment is viewed. Um, maybe not as useful for assignments as it is for your other content in Blackboard, <clears throat> but it is, uh, but it might be a good way to see how many students are actually, if you're having a low turnout on uh, the assignments, it's a good way to see how many people are actually going in and, and looking at it. Um, and so those are all the options uh, for building your assignments. I've put together a very basic assignment right now. So I am going to submit that. And here in my, uh, in my content area, here's the new assignment I've created at the bottom. Um, and I see immediately that I've made a, uh, a, a spelling mistake. I can go in and edit this just by clicking the chevron that appears next to the name of the assignment and going to the top of the menu that appears and selecting edit. And it brings me right back to the area and I could go in and edit my, uh, my, my spelling mistake and resubmit the whole thing. Um, one thing I've mentioned in uh, previous webinars is when you create items in your content area, they'll generally be assigned some sort of icon and the icons change depending on the type of item that the student is viewing. With assignments, you get this nifty little piece of paper with a ruler and pencil. Uh, that always signifies a, an assignment that has to be completed. Um, it's just a quick visual way to help your students find their assignments quickly um, or uh, sort of sort out what's an assignment and what's a re what's a, what's a general thing to look at what's a video that kind of thing um, <clears throat> once this is all completed it's ready for the students to uh, interact with um, I am going to log out of my instructor account here and I'm going to log into a student account go into the course. Here I am as a student. I'm going to go to my course content and here I see several assignments. Um, here's the new one. This is the new assignment. Okay, well I'm going to go here <clears throat> and to the student uh, they get this upload area for the for the assignment. It shows the assignments name at the top uh, and then it gives them all the information, um, when the due date is, how many points they could get. Uh, it also shows them the attachments uh, that are connected to this assignment. If they haven't already downloaded it, they can still download it from here. Now there are two ways students can respond to an assignment. The first and easiest way for them to do it is to just attach a file they've already created. If they've written a paper, they can browse their computer and grab it. Um, if, uh, if they want though, they can, collect, they can click this button that says write submission. And what that does is it presents them with a uh, text editor that they can create their uh, their submission directly in here. Um, would I recommend this for somebody to use to submit their assignments? No, because the, uh, the tools available for editing um, aren't as robust as say using Microsoft Word. However, if it's a, a simple assignment, then maybe it is a good option. Uh, if you're just looking for uh, a brief synopsis of something they've read or, um, or a quick, uh, you know, uh, hey, how do you feel about, you know, the way this happened in history and you just need, you know, one paragraph, maybe this is a good way for them to do it instead of actually creating a, a separate file. But submissions submitted this way also, um, 
it's you only see it the student doesn't get a copy of it so that's another reason why i recommend them using sort of a third party like microsoft word or something like that um, but still possible if they don't have those tools of tools immediately available to do this hey rob yeah so um you just, i totally agree with everything you just said um, but I, I have noticed one time some students will get in the habit of always submitting a Microsoft document. And if you do or over in discussion boards or at a place like this for a shorter assignment, um, if you take the time of opening up Microsoft Word and other format documents for 20, 30 students. <laughs> yeah, it does. It can get, it can get a little cumbersome. That is true. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, so, I mean, just, just a, a random thought. I mean, everything you said, I totally agree with in terms of Microsoft Word. And, and sometimes if you have an interruption, you could lose, you know, a page of text. And then yes. type it all over again because you didn't have it in a Word document. Yes. Um, but anyway, that's just one thought from the No, that's actually a great, uh, it's a great, uh, that's a great thought. Um, um, if a student does use the text submission, I'd still recommend to them that if they can to write their contents in a separate program on their computer uh, so they can save it locally. Um, sometimes if they wait too long, they'll, they'll time out in Blackboard and they think they'll be submitting their assignment and when it actually they're not even logged in and they'll they might lose everything so be creating their their submission in a separate uh in you know something local to them uh like microsoft word and then they could copy and paste it directly into here um, and that way they get to keep a copy as well um, so a couple of questions about that rob um, sure if when they use the, the text submission, it does get saved in their Blackboard account, right? Wouldn't they be able to it on Blackboard? Uh, they'd be able to review their submission. That is correct. Um, they right. don't have like a downloadable file or anything like that. Um, right. And then if once they're not in the class anymore, um, if they haven't copied that, that, that submission, then it's lost to them if they're not in the course anymore. Okay. And then the other thing you just said that perked my ears up was that you can time out in Blackboard? You can. Um, How, what's, if, what's the timeline there? Uh, that's a great question. It's been a while. <laughs> um, well, maybe you, we can find that out because I, I yeah. bet a lot of our students keep Blackboard up all the time. As, as, as long as they're... I know I submitted it. <laughs> so I didn't uh, get it. If they're if they're actively doing things in Blackboard, the timeout won't happen. It's if there's a long period of time where there's no activity, that's when you get the the timeout. Um, and that gets a little fuzzy if you're using the text editor. Sometimes Blackboard doesn't recognize that as activity. So. Oh, okay. But I can I can find that uh, the answer to that question for you. And yeah, uh, I mean I think it's just you. good advice for students to say don't expect that you're constantly because they they don't you know they they sign into something and they keep it up all the time yes yeah absolutely <laughs> and then my final question is um this craziness around can you submit to blackboard via google docs via pages because a lot of our students um again get confounded when they're trying to upload things and sure professor can't read it um, they can absolutely do that. They also have the option to browse their cloud storage. Um, when they click that, oh, you guys, I don't know if this appears to you. Um, yeah, I can see that. Okay. Um, they have the option to create a link to, uh, there's five services that, that uh, Blackboard can connect to. Um, they're the big ones too. OneDrive, Google Drive, Box, Dropbox. Um, they also offer on OneDrive for business. Um, and it's pretty simple to uh, connect your Blackboard to your, your cloud account. Um, once they create that connection, it'll be there and it'll be an option they can select immediately. Um, so I know a lot of students use, say, Google Drive or, or uh, OneDrive for keeping all their documents. And uh, this is a quick and easy way for them to be able to connect those two things and load directly from there. 
But I guess my question is, can Blackboard read a Google um, a Docs file? Okay, so um, there's something written in Pages. From got you. Um, so uh, you can you can upload any file type to the assignment area. Um, and uh, what happens to it after that is really whether you, the instructor, can actually read the file type. Uh, but uh, uh, like OpenOffice saves as default, I think they so save as an ODF file. Um, uh, Google Docs, uh, I believe by default, will save as a .doc. So um, that shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, but uh, people who are using things like OpenOffice, they, if they don't save it as a .doc and it's a file type that you're not familiar with, they can still upload it, but whether you can read it after the fact or not. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there is a, I'll show it in a, uh, in a minute. There is a, uh, a window that'll display the document to you that's been uploaded. If it's not in a PDF uh, .doc format, uh, it can read Excel files as well, um, or RTF. Uh, if it's not one of those file types, it won't be able to display it to you. Uh, so I guess that's really the answer to your question. It, it, will, it, it can't read um, a lot of special file types. So if it's not one of the big standards, uh, you'd have to download the file directly to you to your computer and open it somehow there. <clears throat> Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it's, I think so. I think um, it's probably also at the instructors yeah. and what they, what they can read in their, on their computer. For a lot of, uh, for a lot of um, alternate uh, word processing uh, programs, uh, students, when somebody saves something, they do have the option generally to save it. If they can't save it as um, a dot doc or a, or a PDF, they could they can generally save it as a .rtf, which is a rich text format, right. which saves most of their formatting and everything. Um, and and that is a format that's generally read by pretty much everything. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. I had a, a couple of questions too. Sure, Tatiana. So, um, one of them was. Uh, one of them was about the. Um, you mentioned that you don't uh, that you don't have to have a rubric, and that that would be optional. I know that goes back a little ways yeah. in the submission, but I wanted to just point out that we strongly encourage that you have a rubric or at least directions to explain to students what your expectations are, so that they know. Uh, how they'll be graded. So just wanted to point that out. <laughs> uh, and, um, another thing was, uh, does the text editor in Blackboard have spell checking? Ah, uh, that's a great question. It's been a while since I don't, does it? I don't believe it does. Uh, I was just checking to see if they've added it um, in recent times, but it doesn't look like it. Um, so no, there's no spell checking on it. Um, other than what's sort of built in uh, to your computer. So sometimes um, when you're typing into uh, a web document, your computer will will find spell check errors. Um, uh, so for instance, right here, I just typed in WGH, which is, you know, just nonsense. And it underlined it in red. That's not Blackboard. That's my computer showing me that I've I've misspelled something. Um, uh, but uh, so no, it doesn't have a spell check option. Um, so, so that that's, would be maybe a good reason to encourage students to use Word. So that yeah. Yeah, and then they could uh, again. They could write their documents in a in a pro, in a program on their computer, and then copy that the body of it and, and paste it into the text submission if that's what they'd like to do. Right, that's yeah. what I always recommend to my students too to get that. Yeah. And, and one more no, uh, one more thought. You mentioned uh, group submissions. Yes. 
there'll be an opportunity for us to go over more of the tools in Blackboard that allow for group work? Is yes, um, we have a webinar planned uh, in a couple of weeks using, uh, talking about using groups okay. um, in Blackboard, yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good tool. It, it is. It is a very great tool for, uh, especially when you, you have a large class. <laughs> um, um, all right. Uh, so the student, you know, if they if they're going to submit a, a file, they browse their computer and they can select their file and submit it, and it attaches it and it shows the information. Um, and then the student can actually add a comment uh, to their submission. If they had trouble with something specific, uh, or if they, you know, if they found the, if they just want to say how much they found the assignment enjoyable, they could add that information here in the comment section. Uh, and then they just submit their submission. And this is how it appears to the students. Um, they see a, uh, they they see the assignment area right now. It's just showing me um, this box that says download on it. Uh, Blackboard is processing the file that I've just submitted. Um, in a, a couple of minutes, I could refresh my page and it actually show my document inside Blackboard. Um, and on the right hand side, the student sees their grade. Um, currently, there's no grade associated with this assignment. Um, so they just see nothing out of 100. Um, and they could also re download a submission that they've made if they've uploaded a file, um, which is another reason I like to recommend uploading a document as opposed to using the, <clears throat> the text submission, uh, especially if it's a big assignment. Um, so now that we see what the student sees here, I'm going to jump back into my faculty account. One more question, Rob. Since yes, we talked yes. about text submission, is that something that a student can do on a phone app? I uh, okay. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> well, the only uh, reason I say that is I know you know in the other LMS. I see students submitting work and it looks like it's from their phone. So. Yes, um, I would never recommend trying to use Blackboard on, uh, on your phone. Um, some tools do not function properly in a mobile, uh, in a mobile OS. Um, once we, uh, eventually we'll be moving to a, uh, a format called Ultra, which is a little more uh, in sync with the times and uh, the tools work a little better in mobile devices. Um, but right now I wouldn't recommend that, but they could still try it. And yes, they could uh, enter a uh, text submission with their mobile device. Uh, it's very hard, difficult to read Blackboard in mobile. Um, so that's why I recommend not using it. It's not really formatted for a mobile device. Um, uh, now that we're back in the course as an instructor, I am going to go to the Grade Center. Um, now, once a, a assignment has been submitted, you it goes into a status that's called needs grading. Um, there's a couple ways you can view what's been submitted for an assignment. You can go to the full grade center um, and see what's been, uh, what needs to be graded, what's been submitted. Um, I only have one student in this class. It's me. Um, but uh, um, they have, this person has several assignments that's been, that have been, uh, that have been submitted, including the, the new one that we've just created. <clears throat> um, I can see that right here in the full grade center. This would be showing, if I had multiple students in the course, I'd be seeing all the students though, and any assignments they've submitted that haven't been graded yet. Um, you can narrow that down by just going to the full grade center and assignments, 
and then it just shows assignments. Um, but again, it's a full grade center view. You'd see all your students and anything they've submitted for an assignment. If you jump to this needs grading area though, um, this will show you specifically what's been uh, assigned and what needs to be graded. Um, the new assignment that I created, you'll see that the student uh, submitted it late. That's because I set a, uh, <laughs> a, uh, a date that uh, was not able to be fulfilled <laughs> because, uh, because we submitted afterwards. But I wanted to show you what it looks like if a student does submit late. You just get tagged with this word that says late. The due, and it shows the due date as well. Um, um, the, I'm going to jump to this new assignment and we're going to grade it. Um, I'm going to grade all users. And <clears throat> so this is very similar to what we saw in the student's view. Um, the exception to this is up here where it shows the student's name. If we had multiple students, we'd be able to, uh, we'd be able to scroll through the different submissions. Uh, using the left and right arrows and see each different student's uh, submission for the assignment. Because I submitted a PDF, um, Blackboard's able to display it in, in, in the uh, actual uh, content area. I can look through the assignments. I can page through the different pages. Um, I've got some basic uh, navigation tools to go through the the documents. Uh, optionally, I could download the document to my computer and look at it that way. Um, on the right hand side, um, we have the area where I actually submit my grade and when I click on it, I can enter a grade, but I can also enter feedback to the student, which the student will get when they see their grade. Um, and I could also see that I'm using my writing rubric to grade against um, and I can view it by clicking this button to uh, make sure I'm following the guidelines that I've already set forth for myself as far as a grader goes. And you can also attach more notes. Um, this is for your viewing and not the students. Uh, so feedback is for the student, notes are for you. Um, Hey, Rob. Yes. Just triggered a question there. Um, how obvious is the uh, feedback dialog box to students? It's, I, I find myself writing, you know, 10 minutes trying to explain something <laughs> and they come in the next day and they're like, why did I get a C? That's a great question. I, Let's, uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's submit uh, let's submit a grade here. Let's say, we'll, we'll give this student a 75. And uh, we'll say this, this was late, so a low grade. Um, and we'll submit it and we'll take a look at the student view and, uh, and see what, what it looks like for them. Um, I think it all boils down to attention, Tom. They, they yeah. little <laughs> button, but they don't click on it. I, uh, I agree with that <laughs> statement, but we'll look just so we all have an understanding of uh, what the student does see and so if I go into my grades area, so here's my assignments uh, that just got a 75 and I get a little uh, bubble right next to it that indicates I have feedback. Um, and if I click that, that's when I get a little pop-up that shows uh, why I got a low grade. Mm -hmm. um, but again, yes, I think uh, I think you're right. It, uh, some some of it is attention span. Um, maybe the student doesn't even un know understand that you know there's a there's a feedback view here that they can go and look at. Um, so, not never a bad idea to just mention to the students that if you give if you provide feedback, they can always click that chat bu bubble there to uh, see what the feedback is. Um, I'm going to jump back into because uh, there's one more thing I want to talk about, and that is editing a grade after it's been posted. Uh, 
Um, so if I go into um, the assignments area, you know, here, we, here we have a grade that's been submitted for the student. For one reason or another, they've gotten a 75. If for some reason we want to change that grade, uh, we can do it right here in the Grade Center itself. And this is called a grade override. Um, we enter the new score, just hit enter, and the new one has been uh, submitted. Um, we can also grade things directly in the Grade Center without having to look at the submission itself the same way. Um, once something's been edited here, uh, especially if it's a late assignment, you might have to go and view the assignment again and edit it there. Um, I know sometimes uh, there'll be assignments that come in late uh, and you've already entered, say, a zero for missing the assignment, but this assignment comes in late and for uh, one reason or another, you decide that you know, you'll allow that and you go to look at the attempt and you'll see here um, on the left on the right hand side here's the score we've already provided and uh, and it shows up again in this last great attempted area in this gray area and that's important to note because if a grade has already been added editing here in the attempt area isn't going to work. You have to come up to the gray area and click this override revent button. It looks like a little pencil. When you click that, you'll get this little, uh, the, the box will change and you can change the grade. And by clicking the green check mark, it'll apply it. Um, and now the grade has been overrode. And when you go back to your grade center, Zip, you'll see the new grade. Um, uh, sometimes that can be very confusing because you're used to just going to that blue area and adding a grade, but we want, if you've already put a grade in, you have to go and edit in that gray area. Um, otherwise it won't take the new grade. <clears throat> and that gets me to the end of uh, my presentation today. Uh, are there any more questions? Just a quick comment. I recall um, once I was grading uh, one exercise or whatever it was, and then realized that um, everybody was having trouble with the same component of it. So I decided to go back and give like five points to everybody based on that common concern, you know, taking responsibility for Sure. Um, and so with one student, I like turned the, the 90 I saw into a 95, say, and then realized, oh, wait a minute, I already did adjust her grade. <laughs> the next day in class, she said, it was very strange, but before my eyes, my grade <laughs> changed twice. <laughs> Again, she thought for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, anything else? Any other questions? Uh, I, uh, I guess. In, oh, go ahead. No, no. You, you go ahead. I, well, I, I, again, in my limited as a user of the Grade Center, I, I have very limited experience, but I, I did find it kind of clunky, um, and I'm wondering, like. So if you have a total, let's say of a thousand points that you mm -hmm. can get in the course of the semester, um, does the grade center just automatically build that in? So each time you, <laughs> does, does the instructor have to put that in ahead of time? I guess is what um, I'm wondering. <clears throat> so uh, I'm gonna go with a simple answer this time, <laughs> but it's a yes and no. Um, you, when you're adding assignments, it uh, and they're and they're in you know, you leave that option to add it to the grade center. Yes, it'll add it in automatically, and it'll be and it'll be added to the weighted um, 
the weighted uh, grades. However, <clears throat> sometimes you want to go into your grade center itself and do a little management, and you can set up uh, you can set up a lot more in the grade center tools itself, and I, and we'll be talking about that I think in the next week or two. Okay. Um, uh, the grade center has a lot of management tools for creating different weighted columns, man, uh, and uh, you know what automatically gets added, what doesn't. And, okay, uh, we don't. I won't go too yeah. on that one. And, <laughs> but, uh, and Kathy and Tom are both really good at this, so I, I would assume <laughs> they probably uh, could could help me with it too. But um, yeah, I I just am always um, in awe of when I see professors and they've got everything all calculated at the start of the semester, it really helps the students. Like you said, they see that structure. They yes, the absolutely. Um, and plus it helps, you know, if you, um, you know, if you have a very specific uh, grading format in your syllabus, you want to make sure you go in your grade center and, and set it up to match that. Um, so there's no confusion for your students. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I don't oh. know if actually um, I, every, anybody here can help, but I've been curious to why sometimes whether peer tutors versus mentors and, and, and things, who is able or is it up to the student to grant permission that somebody could go in and see how, how they're grading, what needs doing next, how their rubrics are looking, et cetera. So I'm, frequently surprised as an instructor and of course I have what on average you know 50 lovely LAS one uh, 18 year old <laughs> but, um, they, they walk around as if they're in a cloud somewhere <laughs> and I'm surprised too that either I feel that the data should be available to them they should be able to in my grade see so much as well as yes click on into the message area so <laughs> where your strengths are etc and i'm surprised sometimes um what who or how you have is it up to the student to share that information um so that a mentor mentee etc you know would know or before yes. to us as faculty and what's privileged information and what's okay to share. Does anybody have guidelines for us? Um, so as um, technical wise, <laughs> um, the, the only person who has access to their uh, records as a student in Blackboard is them. So I know as a student, I can go in and I can look at my records, but nobody else other than my instructors has access to that. So if I'm working with a peer in a mentor relationship, um, I could log in and show them, but otherwise they wouldn't be able to access that information unless they had some sort of uh, instructor or instructor-like uh, capacity. Um, uh, as far as good practice uh, education-wise, um, that would really be a good question for um, our instructional designers. Uh, uh, who you know I can put you in touch with, but I'm sure you know them already. Uh, Joel in space and Jennifer Marcolongo and and uh, and Lisa Hayward. Well, I can just answer that question. I think Kathy, as you know, as a mentor, um, when we meet with our students, a big chunk of what we do is is organization, and we dive into the blackboard shell all the time to make sure that they, they see what they're supposed to be doing. And like the comment section um, drives me crazy when my students don't look at the comments. <laughs> so teaching them how to really access Blackboard is a big part of what we do. Yeah. And as yeah. a Bridges instructor, because I'm a mentor, I try so hard to teach my students how to use Blackboard efficiently. And so um, that's why I'm so familiar with many of the faculty's um, content. Um, it may feel intrusive, but it, it really helps us to understand what the students are struggling with. And yeah. if they're not able to access content out of Blackboard, it's, it's, it's really important for the faculty member to know. And uh, I will note that uh, um, probably in the next year we'll be moving to the ultra platform which is a little more uh 
a little more, um, I don't want to say like social media, but it's, it, it's a lot more what, what younger folk are used to using. Um, uh, it's a lot more uh, dynamic and uh, they have a quicker and easier access to their information. Um, it's just a new way to get around Blackboard, uh, but uh, it'll be easier for them to find things like comments on assignments and such. Um, uh, and there's a few extra communication tools in there, so they'll be able to communicate with their classmates easier, things like that. May I, may I quickly follow up on a comment? Uh, I think Tatiana, you made earlier with regard to um, rubrics, and um, it's it's always good to have a dean's ear on. on the, <laughs> um, but I, I just we had a uh, a business owner who was teaching adjunct, and at a training was exposed to rubrics for the first time and how they work and what they look like and examples and that sort of thing. And I'll never forget, the gentleman kind of sat back in his chair and said, thank you. You have just explained to me why when I hire a college graduate, I have to explain every little detail and excruciating detail to them. <laughs> we have need, and I acknowledge the need is greater because of the very backgrounds that students bring and some appear to have done very little in high school, others more. But our job is to get them as squared away as possible. And um, I, I just, if, if that issue of rubrics can remain in the discretionary column for instructors, it shouldn't be abandoned and it should be more frequent with freshmen. And Kathy and I disagree on this to some degree, but it seems to me that by the time somebody is a senior, at least in management division, they should be pretty squared away and not need that much detail on every little assignment. It's convenient if the grade is contested, you know, you can just look at the rubric and say, oh, you did this and this, but not that and that. Um, but at the same time, there's a, uh, I'm sure you get my point. I just, I'm just a pleading that, that that can be in the, in the professor's discretion column. I'm not sure if Tatiana's, oh, oh there she goes. Oh. Well, I just know that when we're doing, uh, you know, course development and redevelopment that uh, one of the standards is that there's always a rubric for every assignment that's graded. So now you could make a rubric that's a little more general versus a little more detailed. Uh, we do have the writing and the discussion board rubric that are pretty standard that we use in all of our courses. But I think the idea is to set up the student for success, explaining what the expectations are. And this also does, I think, help the instructor when it comes to grading, because you, you know you've set it up ahead of time and you know how you can then justify your grade. So. Definitely food for thought there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, I will mention that uh, if you if you ever have any technical questions um, regarding Blackboard, feel free to email me at rhawk at nec.edu. I also have drop-in Zoom time. Um, on Tuesdays from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. and on Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, for any questions, uh, technical questions regarding Blackboard. Um, if you have more um, uh, uh, more procedural type questions for how to set up best set up your your course or uh, or talking about rubrics and such, uh, you can contact one of the instructional designers and they can set up a, a time to meet with you and talk about things like that as well. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in future webin webinars. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, right. That was helpful. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Bye guys. Rob. Have a good Bye. summer. Bye. Bye-bye now.